Welcome to This Week in South Carolina. I'm Gavin Jackson. Governor Henry McMaster ordered this week that beaches and certain shops can reopen, saying that South Carolinians are following social distancing guidelines. Additional news this week was that the governor and state superintendent of education, Molly Spearman, ordered that schools will remain closed for the remainder of the school year. We have the latest from this week. On Monday, Governor Henry McMaster announced that based on the compliance of South Carolinians and input from health officials, that he was comfortable reopening some non-essential businesses he closed weeks ago, as well as allowing communities to decide if they want to reopen their beaches. It'll be some time before we'll see which way these various trends are going and which way the evidence and science will, will dictate that we can take more steps. But uh, we're still in a serious situation, but also South Carolina's business is business. And to the extent that we can, we must let those businesses operate because people want to work, they need to work, the families need to work, they need the jobs, and we're going to do all that we can do to see that they can do that and continue with their lives as much as possible under these very serious situations. On Tuesday, barriers were removed from several Grand Strand beaches, like North Myrtle Beach, Garden City, and Surfside Beach. Myrtle Beach itself, the tourist mecca, remained buttoned up, as did its attractions and main drags, as it, along with several big beaches in the Low Country, remained closed to fight the spread of COVID-19. Beachgoers in Garden City, an unincorporated area in Horry County, were glad to see the ban lifted, but worried folks might ruin it. I think people will get here and just not do it and cause it to be closed down again. But it doesn't really bother us because we can get on the beach. It's the ones that are off the beach that don't have access. So they need to be careful. Health officials say COVID-19 cases in the state have appeared to have plateaued, and deaths also are on a downward path from their highs in early April. Uh, we have not yet seen a consistent decline in case reports. What we are seeing for a few days now is, is a potential leveling off of the number of cases reported. So um, at this time, we don't have good trend data to say that we are actually uh, having a consistent decline in, in, in the course. We, we are seeing a, a plateau of a few days. And so what we really like to see is a, a significant downward trend that lasts, as you mentioned, for at least 14 days to be more comfortable about the disease activity in the community. Governor McMaster announced that K through 12 schools will remain closed through the remainder of the school year. He was joined with Superintendent of Education Molly Spearman on Wednesday for the announcement. Our buildings will not open for the rest of the year, but instruction will continue to go on. So as the governor said, we've got to keep our partnership between teachers and families going really well. And thank you so much, parents, for supporting us through this. With the gradual steps taken this week, along with a previous move to reopen boat ramps and plans to open state parks on May 1st, the governor is convening the first meeting of Accelerate SC this week a group of industry heads, lawmakers, and others that will guide the state forward in its economic recovery from the virus. Accelerate South Carolina will meet this week and as many times as necessary, but to finish the work, advice, and guidance within 30 days. And by then, we should be back in the victory lane with our economy. And joining me now is Dr. Brandon Traxler. She's a physician with DHEC. Dr. Traxler, thanks for joining us again. Sure, thanks for having me. So this week, Doctor, the governor uh, said South Carolinians were complying with some of these social distancing measures that we put in place over the past few weeks, uh, so much so that he's eased restrictions on beach, beach access for the municipalities and some of these retail shops are now reopening. Uh, what kind of data are you all seeing that bears this out to reinforce that, yes, people are following along and, and maybe we can gradually get back to where we were before? So it's, it's still very preliminary and still very early, but we are cautiously optimistic that the the case counts per day in South Carolina, that curve everyone looks at, is flattening some. Um, you know, as I said, it's it's still early. There's still time for that to change, but but we are hopeful that this is going to continue, and we'll see that bear out with the data. But that's very a very good example of people doing the right thing and really adhering to these social distancing guidelines and recommendations. So it's not too soon, in in your opinion, or what you're seeing with the data. We are, we are following the data and using it to, you know, guide recommendations. Um, we still want everybody to remember that regardless of when things open and when things um, or things like schools don't open, whenever you're around other people, you need to be doing that social distancing. Um, even as we go back into, you know, our, our open society, keep those six feet of distance between you and somebody else. 
wash your hands a lot. Um, wear a cloth mask if you're going to be out, you know, potentially in contact with folks less than six feet, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So essentially, I mean, when we look at that, um, what has the data shown so far? What are we seeing in terms of uh, peaks? It sounds like we've passed our peak. Uh, does that mean that, again, I'm not saying all clear, but, you know, again, to keep maintaining these things and, and these distances, but what, are we, what, are we, what can we garner from, the, from that data? So um, we are cautiously, like I said, cautiously optimistic that we have passed um, sort of the high point or the peak. Um, and so rather than seeing necessarily a sharp decrease, we are seeing though that flattening of the curve, that plateauing or leveling off, which, um, you know, for the daily case counts, which is cautiously optimistic. And so, um, so hopefully that will continue and then and eventually decrease down further. People have done a great job. I'm so proud of my fellow South Carolinians and how well they've done to, to flatten this curve. But this isn't the time then to, to relax and, and forget thinking about social distancing. We absolutely need to keep doing what we've been doing in regards to that. Mm -hmm. So is, is, is the case count more important when we're looking at how to do some of these things versus the, de the daily death rate? Or how do we juggle both of those uh, sober in statistics? Sure, sure. They both are, you know, very, very sobering. Um, we keep reminding folks that while we're looking at numbers and data, they do reflect people. Um, all of these numbers reflect somebody's loved one. Um, the case counts are will go ahead of the deaths often. You'll see a little bit of a lag time in the curve for the daily deaths. Um, so it, we are seeing what we would expect, which is that that flattening of the curve for the daily case counts um, with predictably then uh, the the peak and the flattening occurring uh, several days to even up to a week or so, a couple weeks later for the death counts. Um, that just reflects people are diagnosed um, and deaths, you know, usually don't always occur immediately when the person's diagnosed. And what are we hearing in terms of testing? I mean, again, a lot of people kept keep talking about how if we want to open up the economy to back where we were, we need widespread testing. We need more testing availability. What's the strategy right now for DHEC to try and implement a testing uh, strategy so that we can reopen more and more of these businesses and people can get back to work instead of working from home? Sure, and absolutely, we certainly testing is going to be one of the key key things that need to um, be going on to safely go back into into our new normal um, as, mm -hmm. thing, as we have reopened things. Um, our strategy for testing is to continue to encourage folks that um, that are symptomatic, encourage providers that you know have patients who are symptomatic to and meet some of those criteria for recommended um, symptoms and whatnot to go ahead and get them tested. We have capacity at our public health laboratory. Um, we have no backlog. and haven't had a backlog for a couple of weeks at least. Um, we're doing some extra outreach to even some of the underserved areas um, to try to encourage and assist with testing of symptomatic people. Um, we're still not recommending this testing be done for people who don't have symptoms, who are asymptomatic. The current kind of gold standard test um, is one that it's basically a snapshot in time. It tells you at that moment if you're infected or not. But it doesn't tell you what your risk is of becoming infected the next day, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and the, uh, the other type of test that people are hearing about are these antibody tests. Mm -hmm. and there still is a lot of, um, there's still a lot of limitations with those tests currently uh, in regards to, the main thing being we don't know if it shows that you've had a prior infection, we don't know if that protects you. From reinfection, mm -hmm. which is kind of worrisome because you know you think you might get this, get over it, kind of like other diseases and viruses. You get the antibodies, you're kind of good. You get built up this herd immunity. So, it's, is it worrisome that there might not be necessarily the herd immunity coming from this from COVID nineteen? Obviously, we would prefer you know if there was. Um, I think we are preparing though for even if there's not this type of virus, the coronavirus. Um, four other of the of the seven total coronaviruses that can infect humans cause just the common cold. As we all know, we get those repeatedly mm -hmm. throughout our life. Those don't getting those don't protect you from getting it again in the future. So so I think that we are we are prepared that this virus might be of that sort. But certainly it would be great if it did provide some lasting immunity. And can do we need like testing at businesses? I know there's been talk about it, you know, how can businesses reopen safely with folks? It sounds like you're gonna have to have a lot of social distancing in place at businesses, you know, manufacturing facilities. Uh, but it, is it too much to say we need people to be tested at the door, or can there be temperature checks? Or what's the what's the way to open up a Boeing or a BMW? Should that be able to happen in the future soon? 
great question, and that's that's recommendations that we're working on at this moment to be helping provide to the, the companies and businesses in South Carolina. Um, we don't recommend testing of people that don't have symptoms right now uh, to going back into businesses because, as I explained, it doesn't give you an accurate picture of the person's risk of becoming infected the next day or, or on into the future. Uh, we do recommend that people continue doing that social distancing. That's one of the big things is this will take some work um, for businesses and manufacturing places in some cases to figure out how to adjust their tempo and whatnot to, to accommodate that six feet of distance. Um, you know, really encouraging hand hygiene, washing with soap and water for 20 seconds, or um, if that's not readily available, using the hand sanitizer often. Mm -hmm. uh, frequently disinfecting those hard surfaces, that sort of thing. So still a lot to be determined there. With about two minutes left, I want to ask you a little bit about resurgence of this of this virus. You know, like we're saying, it, it, other coronaviruses come and go as often. This is one of them. Uh, what are we thinking? What are you, what are you all seeing p potentially for the summer? Uh, you know, and again, should we resurge? You know, should we open up some of these businesses? Is there a fear of a second wave there? And then also, there's also been a lot of talk about this fall becoming another big second wave or third wave, whatever time we might be at that point. What's the worry there? What's what's the data looking? like at this point? Sure. So I think the data for that um, is still very, is still too early to know for certain. We're basing a lot of this off of similar viruses. Um, we, we hope for the shorter term um, going into the summer that, as I said, people continue doing these social distancing things and um, that each person can individually do and that that'll help keep that curve flat and prevent the case counts from going back up. Um, I think I want to make sure that everybody understands it's not a fear. Um, we're not afraid of it coming back in the fall. We're, we'll be prepared and, um, you know, to to work to decrease it again if it does. And and for a lot of that, it's just going to, we're going to have to wait and see, unfortunately. Gotcha. But um, but people absolutely can keep that, keep that curve low by continuing to do what they've done so far. Some great advice there from Dr. Brandon Trexler, physician with DHEC. Thank you again for joining us. Sure. Thanks for having me. As we've seen in the face of tragedy across the country, many people are stepping up to help. And right across the border in Charlotte, North Carolina, one group is helping making face shields for medical professionals. Charlotte Medi is a group of community volunteers that have stepped up really to help out with the challenge, uh, creating face shields and other protective um, equipment for local hospital workers. So we started about two, two and a half weeks ago or so with a request from a doctor. Um, the daughter of the doctor went to Charlatan and her dad came home and complained about a lack of protective equipment for his staff. So she, being a student of engineering at Charlatan, called up the engineering director there, Tom Dubik, and started this ball in motion. So I then asked other engineering teachers at my school to assist. And then uh, very shortly after that, we reached out to UNC Charlotte and Dr. Fagan, and then the community at large, all the local maker community and sprung into action. So we, what we did is we started first working on a, a, a mask that goes up close to your face and then a shield. Talking to the doctors, we pivoted pretty quickly to, hey, we can make shields. We can make them, we can make them fast. We started 3D printing them. And then once we felt pretty good about our design, went and got in touch with the local injection molding companies. So that's this kind right here. See how that is? That's injection molding. The difference is this visor, if you wanted four of these visors and a 3D printer, it would take you about eight hours. This takes four of them in a minute. So we went from brand new starting from zero to 20,000 masks in about 20 days. If you've noticed in this pandemic, people are all just stepping up everywhere. Charlotte Latin moms were busy putting these things together. So we'd get them cut and made, and then they would take them from mom to mom and family, and when they would put them together. The Charlotte community has really stepped up and really offered services, time, money, um, people to really focus on this. You know, it started off with the actual injection molding. Don't really know how to do that. Don't really know what the process is. Texon Plastics was able to step up um, and really help with that quickly. We had um, CLT Air donated a warehouse to us and trucking services to pick up the large quantities from the injection molding back to the warehouse.
to you laundry was fantastic because we had that last mile distribution. We had all of the components coming into our warehouse, assembly, packaging, and now we had to get it out to 50, 100 different locations. And I said, we're a small team. That would have taken us days and days to do. So companies like Two Year Laundry stepped up who have logistics covered. That, that's what they do. They deliver. They have a fleet of vans out there. So the ability to just um, call them up and before I even finish asking the question, they're like, absolutely, how can I help? Um, one of our core values at Two Year Laundry is, is do good while doing well. And so we were uh, ecstatic at this opportunity to help another local Charlotte group that's producing something that's going to uh, potentially even save lives for others in the Charlotte community. Their response to this, if you will, was we were looking for a way to help. That, that has been a resounding kind of comment we've had. If people want to help, and as I said, giving money is fantastic, but people want to feel like they're doing more. They want to be able to be hands-on and help how they can. Walking up to a doctor and handing him a face shield, walking up to a healthcare worker and seeing the look on their face is that now they are protected. They can continue to do their job. Uh, the thank yous, the, the compliments, everything that we've had from doctors is what makes it all, all worth it. You can't even imagine how much this is appreciated. Um, it's, it's getting busy out there. And I'm joined by Dr. Coretta Jenneret. She's the Associate Dean for Diversity, Equality, and Inclusivity at the USC, School, USC College of Nursing, my mistake. Welcome there, Doctor. How are you? I am doing well. How are you? Great. Thank you for joining us. I want to start off, we're talking about inequalities and uh, misrepresentation and biases in healthcare. I know this is an area of your specialty. I want to ask you what you're seeing right now uh, with what we're seeing in the COVID-19 crisis, what kind of disparities we're seeing, and what the reasoning is behind that. So I think we uh, should not be surprised by the outcomes we're seeing in the COVID-19 crisis when it comes to underrepresented groups um, being disproportionately affected, um, especially in South Carolina and other states. We see that um, even though black populations are uh, make up less percentage of the population, more people are, die, are dying or diagnosed and then are, are dying of the disease. This should not be a surprise given the overall health disparities we have in the U.S. and in South Carolina also. Um, I think a lot of it can can be traced back to the simple uh, social determinants of health. Um, those are the things that uh, basically determine health outcomes, such as where you live, the resources you have access to, um, the amount of education you have. So all of those things, multiple factors play a role in these um, inequities we see in uh, those affected by um, COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about uh, disparities that already exist. Can you kind of just illuminate us a little more? I know you touched on a variety of things, but just mm -hmm. some of the disparities and some of the biases that already exist in the healthcare industry that maybe this crisis is now illuminating or bringing more towards the forefront. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there, there have been uh, many research studies done that show that when uh, certain populations, underrepresented populations such as um, blacks seek health care, that they do encounter biases. For example, they may get um, disparate care. They may wait longer to, to, to get the care that they need. Um, they may uh, be told that uh, perhaps their symptoms don't equate to getting the care that uh, the textbook say, says that they should. Um, and that's playing out in COVID also. Um, we have heard of stories where individuals uh, present with symptoms and then are told that uh, their symptoms are not um, at the level that they should get screened, whereas other people are getting screened without um, having symptoms. So th there are disparities there. We've heard of uh, data that... Uh, may support the fact that um, minorities aren't necessarily being screened at the level that they should be. Um, that has yet to be reported yet that I've seen, but there are um, uh, people stating that they are not being screened when they want to be screened. And then of course, um, we know that um, screening may make the difference uh, in COVID-19 just as in other disease processes. If you're screened early and perhaps treated uh, earlier, you may have a better outcome as opposed to uh, being told that your symptoms don't warrant screening and then you go back home and then you wait and then when you present, you're already um, in a state where it's, it's 
more difficult to manage your condition. So uh, the, the old adage of a stitch in time save nine, saves nine makes sense in this case also. And when we look at some of these folks, especially when we're talking about people who have the ability to work from home and then people who don't have the ability to work from home, we're talking about frontline workers, these essential workers, you know, maybe they're uh, bus drivers, maybe they're commuting in public transport, maybe they're uh, working at grocery stores or Lowe's or places like that where they're interacting more. Is that also maybe a concern when we're talking about maybe lower wage income and, and I guess the value of education and what how you get presented in this situation? Certainly. It all... Uh um, intersects um, in making outcomes different for those people who are less resourced. I um, saw something that made me think about a, a nice analogy that perhaps um, uh, kind of brings this point home um, in that we're all in the same storm in the COVID-19 pandemic, but some of us have a, a different structure. There may be people that are in the yacht in the storm, and then there are people in the dinghy. Mm -hmm. And the dinghy may even have holes in it, and, and that is gonna make a difference in the outcomes. So if, if you're told that uh, you are, um, uh, you've been exposed and you need to go home and quarantine, it's different if you live in a house that has a, uh, an extra room above the garage that has all the amenities and has a, a bathroom versus you live in an apartment that you really don't have a place that you can um, isolate yourself away from your family and you don't have resources to go get a hotel room, those those types of things. Okay. And that, that's another layer on top of the fact that perhaps you're someone, like you said, that may work in an industry where you're considered essential as far as you reporting to work, but your income may not reflect the fact that you're essential and you may not be getting hazard pay, which has been something that uh, has been represented as, as something that would kind of level the pay playing field for those people who have to actually go into work. So we have about three minutes left and I want to talk about nursing uh, students, mm -hmm. your current informed, but mm -hmm. before we jump into that, just want to wrap up. What do you think needs to be done then to help maybe level this playing field in this storm that you said? Mm -hmm. I think um, we need to do things that we already know um, would help mitigate this these issues. Um, we, we, if we already know their health disparities, then the the resources should be put in areas where there are disparities. Um, and, an, and another analogy I think would be appropriate: if you go in, if you're a firefighter and you go into a neighborhood, you're not going to necessarily put water on all of the fires. You're going to put the water on the house that's on fire. So if the data is showing that uh, uh, blacks and other minorities are disproportionately affected by COVID-19, then there ought to be some attention to making sure that resources are given to these underrepresented minorities, that they're um, prioritized and screened appropriately to make sure that um, we kind of level this playing field that this group of people aren't um, disproportionately affected. And we have heard DHEC saying dispatching some of these quicker rapid tests to some of these communities too, so I'm assuming that's what they're talking about. So uh, transitioning mm -hmm. to nursing students, mm -hmm. Dean, Associate Dean at the College of Nursing there at USC, I'm wondering what have you heard from your students who, who are dealing with this or maybe the ones who are out in the field right now dealing mm -hmm. with us on the front lines, mm -hmm. what's it like mm -hmm. and are they getting the, the support and the protection that they need to do this? So our students, um, the undergraduate students, of course, um, are not able to go to clinical um, because it's really not safe for them to do so, and the healthcare systems need to concentrate on um, doing the measures that they need to do to take care of patients. Um, we do have uh, students that are still working um, in healthcare as uh, nursing assistants and doing other things uh, that are outside of their role as students. The students are um, excited uh, to, to play their role and they're do, volunteering and they're doing other things. Uh, our students have been wonderfully um, responsive in, in all the ways that they can be and we're proud to say they are the future of nursing. So um, our, our students have been very responsive and we, we, we support them and we, uh, we're excited that they are um, doing their best to um, deal with the transitions they've had to make to, um, to uh, transition their education from face-to-face to, -face to um, virtual. And Dr. Jenner, have you, with like about 30 seconds left, have you spoken to some former students perhaps who are in the field and are on these front lines in hospitals in South Carolina, how they're handling this? 
we hear wonderful reports from um, from them as far as the passion they have to deliver excellent care. But it, it is difficult when uh, when they're challenged with um, not having a necessary um, protective uh, equipment. Um, but but they're doing their best to um, to provide the best care and also to protect themselves and their families. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did see that, that tragic death of that USC Aiken nursing student, Joshua Bush, who was working, like you said, like so many of the students do, mm -hmm. part-time at a medical care facility. So uh, more details about that. But again, just showing how real and how tragic this virus has been in just a short span. Yes. Yes, the, the nurses and other um, healthcare professionals are um, definitely on the front line, um, and that <clears throat> means a whole lot uh, that's not even captured in, in those words. So the nurses, the respiratory therapists, all of those people um, who are kind of unsung heroes in, in some ways um, that are now being brought to the forefront of, of the, the important role they play in healthcare is, is, is one of the good things that's come out of this tragedy. Well, Dr. Coretta Jenneret, thank you very much with the Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusivity at the USC College of Nursing. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. For the most recent South Carolina COVID-19 news, check out the South Carolina Lead podcast. We're releasing multiple episodes each week to keep you up to date and informed on what's going on with COVID-19 in the state. From South Carolina ETV Studios, I'm Gavin Jackson. Be well, South Carolina.